So I'm going to present a book by Bayo Akumolase, and it's called This Wild Beyond Our Fences and Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home. And as the title says, he writes seven letters to his daughter, and he speaks about a lot of things. So it's like a very complex book. Um, he's um, speaking to his daughter, which I find it very interesting because he is actually aware of who he's speaking to instead of, you know, most of books where they're just speaking to a general audience. So he has a purpose there and he has this relationality going on during the entire book. But it's complicated to talk about it because he speaks about so many subjects because he's talking about humanity. And he is um, like weaving all the subjects uh, together with his own story and his daughter's uh, story. So I had to present it a different way today because of that complexity. So I'm gonna um, start presenting it. And the first part, so just a heads up, the first part is this huge thing. <laughs> but it's not as uh, difficult as it looks because I, I'm sure most of you might be aware of, of what he's talking about here. So it's kind of a timeline of how humanity thinks and interprets the world. So first he's of course speaking about, um, uh, he's speaking about the cat and how uh, we started, uh, seeing the world as a binary thing. And because of that, we had, while colonialism was happening, while Europe was going to America and Africa and um, how this shaped, how we conducted, you know, everything, um, economy, and that led us to uh, modernity and how we separated our bodies from our minds and, neoliberalism. So I'm going to go quickly through this because I think this is like we always talk about it. Um, he also talks about an interesting thing uh, when about postmodernity. That's uh, when Picasso, um, Picasso's cubism emerged from his interactions with African art. And, um, and so he starts reflecting on his own uh, search for making sense of the world and going through all of this history. And, and then he says that at some point he started thinking of everything in terms of stories. So it's always about narrative and how you tell the story. But then he said that this was not enough. Um, and I want to ask for a volunteer if they want to um, read this uh, column here, if they can. Anyone? Linguistic constructionism thus took on the postmodern mantle of turning attention to the complicated dynamics of discourse, of language, of words, or how we create meaning, the politics of sight, or how perceptions already irretrievably burdened by, with human subjectivity, so that our hopes of discovering the real world outside of our representations of it were largely hopeless, and how the material world therefore dwells at an inscrutable distance from our cultural rituals of knowing. The energy moved from what exists, ontology, to what we know uh, what exists, epistemology, and new settlements sprouted in the now conquered fields. In time, these ideas percolated into mass culture and especially subcultures concerned with consciousness and social change, spawning memes of change, the story, change the world. We look at it for granted that all that mattered were our stories, our language. So he defines it like that, uh, this uh, phase that's uh, postmodern and linguistic, linguistic constructionism. And he says that it was halfway there, that there was something still missing. And then he goes on his quest for trying to find what that is. And uh, 
and he starts thinking about how we live in a world that is largely populated by non-humans and that aspect is still missing. So, whoops. Um, so he, um, so he starts thinking about this new materialism because that's what is actually missing. Uh, and he says that it turns out that there are things beyond story, beyond human subjectivity and beyond experience. And it is the conjunction of um, ontology and epistemology on um, body and mind and materialism because of a new materialism because of that. Um, any other volunteers for reading this column? The new materialisms embrace interdisciplinary work into the ways culture and nature can no longer be seen as separate, into the way identity and race are both material and discursive, into the way biology is already a matter of history and the discussions about it, into the manner, concepts and meanings um our material into the particular ways justice is not some giant supernatural arc spanning the globe like an ideal we can only ever hope to approximate but shaped and born in to topological openings and closures so he gets inspired a lot by agential realism that's uh, karen barrett's um, theory and he starts thinking that nature is agentic. Uh, it acts and those actions have consequences for both the human and non-human world. So what that means is that um, you start questioning everything else, like you start questioning activism because if you are not responsible for everything that happens, if you have other agents acting there, then what does that mean to be an activist, right? Um, so he gets uh, inspiration from Yoruba, from Dana Haraway, and especially from Karen Barrett in Ontoepistemology and the interdependence of things. And while he's speaking about all these uh, thoughts here for humanity, he has a few concepts. Um, let me just go through the... So he has a few ideas that he wants to talk about that is the cracks in the dust, which means that, you know, he, he starts as a Christian from um, uh, Nigeria and he believes in this uh, idea of heaven. And then he starts questioning it because there is this idea of pristineness that uh, doesn't fit. And he says, what the vaunted city of gold and high walls excludes isn't all that's ugly, but other forms of, of beauty, beauty. So he starts believe, thinking that what is clean and pristine is not what is right. It doesn't seem right. And you have to look into the cracks and let the dust come. And he speaks about monsters. Any volunteers for these two paragraphs? Monsters keep the world fresh to the one who supposes that things are settled, that forms are given, that the road is clear. Monsters spring a surprise, opening the new in the belly of the old. In the monster, we do not come to the end of critical analysis. We meet its querying. We come to touch the silences and gaps that our discursive grasp cannot comprehend. So he's saying that the only way that you can imagine something better and different is by having a relationship with monsters and by becoming lost. So he uh, talks to his daughter that uh, the best thing she can do is go to the precipice, like the end of the road, because that's where things will flourish. Other uh, ideas that nobody else um, looked into, or perhaps they did, but um, did not account for other non-humans in the journey. So he says that uh, the journey never has a beginning. It starts in the middle. 
And he says that perhaps this is the next frontier, not outer space or inner space, but the spaces between. So you're always in the middle, always in the fall, not getting there, uh, not quite there, but getting there. It's, it's the path, right? Um, and then, so as I said, he's speaking a lot about stories about his life as well. And at some point, because of that um, thinking of, you know, becoming lost and going to the edges, he goes to visit a family in a slum in India. And he starts thinking that modernity makes us believe that uh, Kuri, the person, the, the father of this family, he is uh, the poorest of the poor. And the only proper response is therefore charity. But when he goes there, he realizes that there's, they're like in a parallel world from modernity and he starts realizing that they live on the margins. And that's why it's interesting to, you know, be there because that's when you're always trying to push the barriers and you have to live in a different way that doesn't fit the system. Um, there are two subjects that he talks in his book that I think that are really important to bring to this um, book club because this the, he takes a, a, a perspective on racism and climate change that is related to new materialism and agencia realism. And I really wanna speak about it. I think it's the, like the most important thing in the book because this gives us some idea of what he really he's really talking about in today's problems. Uh, so he first says that blackness is a phenomenon of white arrangements. What that means is that um, the product of the white arrangements is the you trying to affirm your blackness. And um, does anyone want to read this paragraph? Blackness is a product of white power, a response made possible and meaningful within present frames. In asserting the purity of our identity, in essentializing the other and fixing power in this modern logic of hierarchy and ascendancy, we are blinded to ways of being otherwise with planets, with people, with generations to come and with power. So he um, thinks about racism and how um, affirming uh, your position as black is sometimes connected to affirming your position as the victim. And you can only say that when um, you're using this uh, system that's already there to tell you that you're the victim. And this is like mind blowing because there are you know, depending on how you take this, it can be something amazing or something like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's why he like goes back to this theme on and on and on. And um, I don't know if I will be able to explain exactly what he means with that, but um, I'm gonna try. <laughs> I'm gonna read this book because it's really short. I slowly became, I slowly came to the realization that even victimhood could be oppressive. Power shows up in ironic ways. In fetish, fetishizing my blackness, I was perhaps guilty of some kind of conservation of victimhood and po polishing of enemy figures. And, and this is what like, this is where he gets to the point of what I call the post uh, activism, which is you thinking beyond just as you know, humans that were gonna alone change the world. And when he speaks about what is uh, racial justice, he says that um, we always think of food security and access to shopping malls, prosperity as more dollar bills than one can spend. So because we're stuck in the system, this is what we think that uh, racial equality is. And that's blinding us from uh, thinking of new ways of being because we're just trying to compare ourselves with uh, 
other people in the system or higher in the pyramid. And, and then finally, he gets this kind of conclusion. Does anyone wants to read this part? For healing to happen to both. Go for it. Okay. For healing to happen to both white and black, to address white supremacy, a new ethos is demanded. A quantum leap from keeping the other at bay to noticing we are already the others. Already entangled in palimpsests palimpsis of trauma and possibility and co-becoming. New concepts disturb the rigidity of identity and help us to see already entangled we are. How prolific, promiscuous, porous and potent our becoming is and how this can inspire a different ethos of responsive responsivity. So that's the whole idea of uh, what he's speaking in uh, new materialism and agential realism. Uh, and when he talks about climate change, uh, he brings the exact same uh, concern because we're tackling this as we are the only agents um, of causing and um, of fixing uh, climate change. Um, so one thing that he explained is that uh, carbon trade assigns monetary value to the Earth's shared atmosphere. So because we framed the world in this way, we can compare, you know, climate change with money. So this is the relation they're creating here to tackle this problem. And um, he says that this is too narrow. This doesn't make sense. Um, let me see where he speaks about it. Here, uh, anyone, volunteers? I can read it, I just need it big, bigger. Thank you. Um, well, a little too big. Oh, you can't see it? <laughs> Got it, got it. Um, the unit of climate change is thus not carbon emission measured by supposedly neutral metrics. Carbon emission is an abstraction with universalizing effects. It is too narrow, too linear, and too stunted an explanation for climate change. Moreover, it serves as a single future. It is the colonizing racetrack that imposes a technology on the world and tracks on the politics of sustainability to the to this furniture. Greater carbon emission equals bleak future equals no humans. So what he's saying is that we're just stuck there. And this doesn't give us any possibility of thinking of other futures and other ways to tackle this. Um, and then uh, what he said, and, and then like while I was reading, I was like, so, so what is the purpose? of doing anything. But then he says that it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do all we can, <laughs> but he is inviting us to a new way of like bringing other, um, other um, concerns and other ways of seeing it and other agents for everything that we're questioning. And he, he says, we don't have to have the answers. Yet, so that le led me to thinking of the questions uh, when he talks about questions in the book, because uh, what I put here is all like all over the book, and this was my way of making sense of it, organizing it a little bit. So I got uh, excerpts from different parts of the book. So about the questions, this is what um, this is actually a, um, a quote he gets from I don't remember who, but it's in the book. Um, a question feels like a river to me and an answer feels more like a stepping stone placed within it. Useful in slightly shifting the river. Useful to human feet just trying to get across sometimes. Useful as a record that humans come this way often. So by that he means that the most important thing maybe is asking questions more than answering them. Um, 
And then uh, he also says that questions, they don't just appear out of the blue. It's being curated and to the point that you have a question in your mind. It's because a lot of things that surround you and connect you with the world and the non-humans, they're acting the whole time. And it is uh, going back to what he said before, it is about the path. It is about uh, the middle part of, of it. It's not about getting there. It's not about the answer itself. And um, so to conclude about questions, he say thoughts don't come from within, neither do they come from without. They emerge between. And that means that we're all connected. We are the world, we are the earth, we are the elements, we are connected to the diseases, to everything else. And one final thought that I wanted to just leave it here is the entire world is failing and bending and seeking with me because I am not in the world. I am the world in its specific self inquiry. So this is my, I'm just trying here to <laughs> grasp the important things from the book, but I really recommend that you read it because it's very complex. He speaks about so much more than this that I'm showing you here today. But I thought that those two points when he's uh, talking about racism and climate change with the lens of new materialism and agenda realism were like points for discussions here today. So I guess now I'll open for our discussion. Thank you, Jananda. I think it was very interesting. And also when he talks about uh, the responsibility of activism, because sometimes we see more related to the short term in changing something immediately that is urgent or something like that, that is very visible and important. But the fact that we usually, we cannot control the impact of uh, activism all the time because we cannot control all the things around us and all the effects that uh, activism can have on people uh, can make on people that is i think a good point that perhaps i haven't reflected on a lot before this statement just an observation thank you for the presentation it was great Thank you. Um, I'm going to share the link to this mural board so everyone can have access and read everything if you want. And yeah, just adding to Mar what Mariana said, it's, um, it's, he's talking about uh, this presum presumptuous um, behavior of humans to think that they are responsible for everything alone. And that leads to this, like, for instance, wanting to go outer space and colonizing outer spaces, uh, uh, you know, because we don't need everything else that's here on Earth. And um, the other point is that it's not just that um, so we have less responsibility because we are connected to everything. So our responsibility is as big as everything else, right? I'm curious um, if in the book, you know, like when he's talking about racism, if he acknowledges like his different point of view, um, you know, as he, he lives in India, right? And, yeah, yeah, he chose to live in India um, when his uh, daughter was uh, going to be born. He, he chose to go to live in India. Right. So I was just wondering if that comes into the book at all, um, just because it's a really different point of view, you know, and, um, if, if he writes about blackness as a Nigerian, that's that's one point of view. And then writing about blackness as a person living in India, it's I just wondered if you could see that in the writing somehow. Yes, he speaks a lot about it. He when he's going to speak about Nigeria, he says, well, First of all, to give you a little context, his father was a diplomat. So he was living in a privileged 
uh, world somehow. But when he's, I think, 15, his father dies and his mother has to go sell fish in, in, on the street. Um, and but his uh, what he says about uh, Nigeria is that Nigeria is too much trying to copy uh, um, the um, colonizers' way of living, and that's what they aspire. And and there is this kind of um, hierarchy between different types of black people. He says, "I am black, black." Um, actors in Hollywood are black. <laughs> So he puts this uh, hierarchy somehow just to try to explain to his daughter those different tensions that occur with um, race. And he speaks a little bit about when he moves to India, how you know people on the streets are fascinated uh, by the color of his skin. Um, his kind of um, also there's a lot of racism. Um, so and he tries to explain a lot about you know the whole context of racism to try to help people not to jump into con conclusions right away. He's not trying to say that this is the solution for all our problems. This is how we have to think right now. He's just suggesting that we acknowledge that and bring that in, in our thoughts when we're um, trying to ask questions or answer questions. Leslie, you have a similar experience because you come from Trinidad and then you studied in Brazil and then you studied and, and, and you are working in the, the, the United States. So you have this, this very different uh, context and like uh, how blackness changed when, 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 you, when you moved around because you have <laughs> like this experience. Yeah, so that, that's why I wanted if he talked about it, you know, because it's just what you said. Blackness is a different experience in different places. And, uh, um, you, you know, like I might talk about racism in the States, but actually if someone stops me and says, well, OK, but you don't even know about racism, they might be right. I mean, it, it, well, on, on another hand, they, they are not correct because as a black person, you're going to experience whatever black people in that place experience, but you, you might then also have a different ex, um, vision and experience. And so I just wondered if he also talked about that change in perception in different places. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know I have to read the book, but I, I was curious to hear if he referred to, to all of those changes. Um, in perspective, and I really yeah, he, he, just can, can I just just have yeah, like yeah. just one one comment to the, and that just uh, Leslie and I we are friends for, for many 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 years, and I saw how her her perspective changed when she moved to to the United States. How just the, the, how uh, it was a big 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 change. That's why I say say you are the perfect person to 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 talk, to talk about the the, the the subject. And and you know so if okay yes to continue this a little bit if you are a black person who is not in the United States you really do not understand racism um, because it's such a different experience here, you know? And so like, um, like when I go to Trinidad, people in Trinidad tend to kind of dismiss how black people respond to racism and, you know, because it's just something that is not understandable, right? Um, they always think, well, okay, those people must be overreacting. And I, I just wondered, you know, like, if Bio is talking about racism, does he acknowledge um, that it is a different place, that he will have a different experience? Or do we read in his language anything that will tell us about his different experience? But I will go and get the book. <laughs> yeah. And actually, we can have another discussion after because it's so rich. But what he, I think what he would say is that each person, in each uh, individual, even though we're all connected, we're connected and we're part of this complex thing, but we have different experiences, right? Um, and he, um, I, I don't think he tries to, actually quite the opposite. He doesn't try to um, generalize racism, 
um, or anything else. Uh, and that's exactly why he is um, suggesting that we think in a different way. So if we remove this mindset that was uh, that comes since uh, the 17th century, what else is left there for us? And but he acknowledges that our urgent problems right now that need to be addressed. And you can't just be thinking um, in this very um, untangible way all the time. So you have urgent matters that you need to address right now. There is a question from Kirk. Would you like to ask Kirk to everyone the question? <laughs> from yeah. this, how do we become lost in dust and monsters and uncover better questions that put light on these shadowy corners of assumptions. So some of the things he did was, for instance, going to the slum and living there with his uh, family. Um, he also um, went to see kind of like a, sh uh, a shaman and the shaman tells him to find 10 hushes, like 10 um, bugs. <laughs> And when he finds the 10th bug, he will know the answer because he, his quest is to find the meaning of home. What is home? How, how do you find home? And um, so every time he finds a hush, he's getting new insight. So by going to, um, you know, the places that are not the center, that's one way to start. You start in the middle, which is kind of the... Um, the edges at the same time, it's kind of complex, but it's by not being in the mainstream, by, you know, um, looking into things that are not, um, that are not in the system. And I feel like this is really connected to our search when we speak about the pluriverse, when we speak about indigenous um, ontologies and epistemologies, I think it's us trying to go to the cracks and, and go to the edges, and, which is the middle. <laughs> yes, the, the, just the, I really like what, what Rita posted that the Sousa Santos calls it moving beyond the abyssal line, but maybe just the middle is the abyssal line itself. <laughs> Yeah, and he speaks a lot about this fall. When you're falling, like you, you, you fall from, he, he has a lot. So this is the book with most metaphors that I read in my entire life. <laughs> and he speaks about, you know, when you're in heaven and everything's pristine and he start asking, so why do you need, you, I, I think that all the houses are the same, but why do you need houses and bricks and walls if there's only us there, <laughs> you know? And he starts thinking about the fall. He speaks a lot about, um, what's her name, Lilith, you know, and how uh, she was expelled from, um, from Eden and, and how we have to pursue her. We have to fall. And it's not about what we're gonna find when we fall. It's about the fall itself, you falling, <laughs> which is very connected to Zen Buddhism, in my opinion, because it's something I'm interested in that is the middle. Right. Noemi has a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of more um and to a certain extent pe people are sort of walking around this as well. I wondered, um, Danda, if you could talk a little bit about how he understands the middle, because I I wonder whether there are different middles in a way, because sometimes if I think of a middle, I think of being in the middle of something, so like, you know, if you're in the middle of the stream, you're in the main stream, you're kind of in the middle of it rather than towards the edges. Whereas if we are sort of in between, that kind of seems to be between two different things. So I wondered what, I, yeah, I just, uh, again, I, I haven't read the book, so I'm, I, you know, I'm not speaking from a point of knowing, but I wondered how he meant how he means the middle, or does he kind of almost meanders through different definitions of middle as he goes through? Because I think it's actually quite fascinating, especially in kind of relation to the the the, the points you are making about the climate change um, and and the way we think of ourselves. Kind of maybe we're in the middle of climate change and and climate emergency, and 
and the, the the kind of the current discourses are around this sort of mobilization and activism to for us to do something as as, as a humanity. But actually, you know, should we be um, in a in a kind of different definition of the middle of what does the middle mean? And and maybe that difference might allow us to understand how we can act, how we can engage, and and not be necessarily overwhelmed. So. I wondered if if you could maybe talk a little bit about this. And I know pe people have commented about the middles, but um, like I said, I'm not 100% sure I understand it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. He speaks about everything, which is the hardest thing in the book because it's so easy to fall into, um, I don't know how to say this in English, nihilism, is that the word? Yeah. <laughs> because then what is the purpose of it all? But he speaks about one, the cracks, in between, which mean things that are already established. And the other thing is being the thing itself. So you are climate change. You're not separate from it, right? So he means all of this. Um, and that's his invitation to, okay, if we bring this to our attention while we're thinking this problem of climate change, what can emerge from that? What can emerge from the crack in the middle? <laughs> You know, in us as, and he, at some point he says, even by just thinking of it, it's already impacting everything else because we're connected. So in a way, does he mean that the cracks themselves have middles <laughs> as, as a place of being, as a place of existence? <laughs> no, no, I think, well, in my perspective from what I understood, I think there uh, sep the two different things, one being the crack that is where you're going to find alternatives. So you have already established that the, the Anthropocene, so mm -hmm. this is um, something established. So if you crack it, it and inside the crack and where the dust comes out of it, it's not pristine, it's not a logical explanation. That's where you're going to find sense and different ways of seeing things. And when he says and, and the other part, perhaps I'm not expressing myself very well, but the middle is the path, is you falling instead of thinking of where you're going, it's just the fall itself. You're yeah. constantly moving. He, at some point he says to his daughter, watch this sunset because this is the last, the unique one that you're seeing because tomorrow you will come to the same edge here of the sea and you're going to watch the sunset and it's going to be a different one. Sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I was like you when I was reading the book, <laughs> moments of silence, just thinking and making sense of it all because it's, it's uh, hard. It's uh, mind blowing. So when I get um, kind of stumped in this place of silence, I get a little literal and I'm like, okay, so what does this mean for us for, as designers? So maybe that's the question. What does this mean for us as designers? Uh, one thing that this um, last little bit of the conversations made me think of is <clears throat> how he would relate to maps. And um, like if you were uh, walking or, or going towards the middle or within the middle, if you had a map, if that would negate uh, this journey. Um, and as designers, maps are so integral to so much of the work that we do, whether it's journey mapping or um, just sort of the internal map of how we describe uh, ideas, problems, projects. Uh, and so I wonder um, what would happen if we sort of uh, intentionally went against this idea of creating maps within design projects and uh, spent more time uh, in sort of this unknown, awkward uh, state? Yeah, he actually speaks about maps. He says that everyone knows that maps are never going to represent the truth. It's never going to have all the details and all the different things we need to know and feel about some place. And that's an interesting thought. And that's what I've been thinking about a lot is like, okay, as designers, as at some point we started thinking that we were responsible for change and, you know, 
this um, hero and, and savior complex and moving to being the mediators of things. But now we have to think we're not mediators of people, we're mediators of everything else, humans and non-humans. What does that mean in our practice, right? That's very interesting that uh, uh, you talked about too. And uh, I personally think that it depends a lot on the perspectives and experiences of people because what may be true for me, for me to me, it may not be true for to another person because they have a different perspective. I mean, uh, you know, from life experiences and how they acknowledge they play space or even when we talk about design, it may be true for me, uh, to me, but not to others according to their own experiences, as well as to different cultures that we see nowadays, it's very clear if uh, we go to the example, extreme example of native peoples who have different visions about nature and relationship with non-humans. So I think it changes a lot depending on that as well and how we experience our knowledge and feel the, this debut environment as well. Yeah, he speaks about that when he's talking about post-modernity um, uh, because then we turn into everything is relative, but at the same time, we say that everything is um, story. It depends on how you interpret, how you tell the story and the narrative around it. But then he says we have to go even further and bring to this the actual um, matter to this. And that's when he goes to putting together mind and body, all the types of experiences. And that's when it becomes so complex that at some point I was like, this is just too much. <laughs> then it means anything is anything and whatever. <laughs> and then there's no purpose. And then by the end, he goes back and says, well, calm down. It's not like that. It's not that I'm saying this is the new truth. There's no such thing, but it's just, something to inspire us when we're bringing things into consideration. Oh my God, but I have this, this, this movement that is always happening with me that sometimes I just, oh my God, it, it's useless. It's completely useless. So I go to the nihilism and say, oh, just, okay, everything is lost. I'm super apocalyptic. And, uh, and then you have to, to understand that maybe that, that's, the, 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 that's the purpose. It's learning how to live with this this experience it's just a matter of just what do you do with this so and then okay let's try to 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 relax into this situation and do whatever is at hand but i totally understand because you go to to to, to some some especially i i go to some point and say okay it's all lost but no it's not lost because we are here so Let's come down, slow down, and relax, and see what what we can do. Not to um, solve things, but to interact with the things as they are. That's the that's the the difference. That's how it yeah. <laughs> makes sense. And this is the hardest thing because since the seventeenth century, we're just learning all the time that we are individuals. We have an ego, and we. Uh, are responsible for things. We are active in what we do on earth. And then at some point you have to just change that and think that you're part of the movement. And you know, you are racism, you are climate change. So what does that mean that you have to remove this layer of, um, or part of this layer of individual to become everything else? <laughs> this is the hardest thing. And there is the hero ship, like the, the, the savior, the, the hero ship that, that I say, say that's the, I really think that's the founding myth of modernity, like hero. We have like the yeah. tools to, to solve the things. And at the same time, just what's the use of 
tools? What's the use of what to create? So we always, uh, I th think that a lot of modern thought, we think that we have the tool to solve, to finish, to complete something. And what if we have to, to start to, to, to have another perspective when we create, when we design, that we are not trying to, 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 to finish something. You are trying to change the interaction of that. So the, to keep things in movement. So it changes a lot the, the goal of design. So that's... Exactly. And, and it's like what he says that makes sense to me is that instead of trying to solve the problems, you don't even know what the question is. So try asking different questions. And instead of being the agent for changing, the sole agent for changing things, just spread seeds out, you know, just ask questions, just start thinking of or searching in the, uh, in the gaps of everything, start falling and then this action will actually impact everything else. As he said, just by thinking, and this is kind of hard for a designer that wants action. <laughs> but yeah, one think. thing I thought was um, my little kind of light bulb, or, or sometimes I need a conscious thing. And these books that we read remind us, oh, it's not all about people, <laughs> you know, because um, certainly in my design practice, I talk about people, you know, I'm using this human centeredness and I really talk about people and I'm kind of doing like identity based design stuff. And then someone, you read something that reminds you, oh, we're just part of this bigger universe. And, you know, I find that line about the nature having agency. It's simple, but you know, it's that sometimes the reminder that um, I think some of us who are very, very human centered need a reminder that, oh, it's not just about humans. Yeah, Rita, I feel please. like when <laughs> just, yeah, Rita, please, please <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Hi, Renata. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, um, I think somebody asked the question about the impact, I think Naomi about um, the impact of design uh, to education, but I think that that's something I've really explored in my PhD, which is almost finished, um, you know, that we have to listen, um, you know, rather than jumping to solve things, I mean, particularly those of us working in the global south, you know, it's about learning to listen not bringing those tools, you know, being participatory and listening. And, you know, it's um, a kind of uh, a global um, knowledge building, isn't it? Um, and becoming, you know, global citizens rather than thinking that we always have the answers or that we own these knowledges that we're recovering. Um, that's just what came to mind. I mean, I love Bayer's work. I follow him, you know, he's involved in this sort of, non-duality and he works with Gabor Mate and I mean he's incredible um, you know he deals with trauma so for me because I know that part of his work that's why I say he's very much looking at embodied embedded um, um, work and, and really this sort of idea of embodiment we have to embody climate change you know we have to live breathe we are it you know we do you know what I mean? Um, sorry, I'm trying to read at the same time. <laughs> oh my God, I just, just uh, lastly, what I recommend by, by him, just watch his talks. Yeah. Watch his talks, please do it. <laughs> That's... Yeah, no, he's, he's really fantastic. I mean, he's so imaginative. So this idea of, you know, this abyssal thinking, you know, he just goes, so poetic, um, which is what we need. He's a great storyteller. Yeah. To go beyond all the critique. I mean, those of us that are have critical perspectives, it gets exhausting, doesn't it? To sit in all of that critical. Um, so to have this wonderful poetry of his text, so, so inspiring. Yeah. And be prepared if you read this book, because there's a lot of this there. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm so glad to rejoin this group because I, I, I've had to kind of 
sit back to get this beast out in the next week. <laughs> so to what uh, Leslie was saying before, I feel like the more we get closer to indigenous perspectives, the easier it is for us to understand that it's not human centered, that it's not about just this kind of relationship. Um, so but once then there is the, the, the there is the challenge because a lot of the indigenous perspectives are very taboo, are very 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 taboo. It's a very just so it's the thing you get close to the indigenous perspectives, but how can you access those parts that that, that are beyond the line that are beyond what is acceptable by modern thought? That is also a challenge to to, to get you go close to, the to yeah. Then you go to the monsters and the cracks. <laughs> Because he, one thing that's clear is also that it's not, you don't have an, a definite answer. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to, you know, go to, to indigenous knowledge and then I'm going to learn everything I need to know to change things. It's not as simple as that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's a way of, you know, removing this aspect of only humans. It's, it's, um, understanding the other things that are affecting you and everything else. And, and what it, wisdom is, what knowledge is, knowledge is not something you can own. Knowledge is um, relationship. Brazil? Well, I was just thinking about this idea, you know, back to the indigenous, I mean, the Balinese, you know, those of you that know me, I lived in Bali for, 18 years so that animist culture you know you start to feel and think differently about the world you know there's um so for example the Balinese they don't have um the kind of two value logic that we do in the west they 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 operate in the between um you know there's three so it's very much that you know in terms of plurality it's an interculturality but not just about people it invites you know the whole um the whole universe the whole cosmologies um i mean they make offerings you know to to cars to motorbikes to um animals uh you know so when you're living in that environment you 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 embed it um so it's because you can't just what what are you I understand what I learned is that it's not that you're going to find the answers, you're going to get understanding. You're going to get changed. That's it. That's the purpose of you to, to, to get changed and to be able to engage with things that are like, like completely banned from, from. It's not in your mind, it's a body, you know, your, your body um, receives it. Mm -hmm. Um, they say that, that in indigenous uh, knowledge is about relational accountability. Well, I, I, and I don't say that. It was Sean Wilson who said that. So it's, it's about acknowledging everything, right? And like when we were talking about uh, how Bio talks from his own positionality as a Nigerian man living in India, how do we also acknowledge where who we are, right? And, and like Leslie was saying, how, how her blackness change, depending on, that, that happens to us as Latin American as well, right? And how do we take from those learnings, from that listening that you said, uh, Rita, that we have to do, how do we take from that listening, that acknowledgement that, you know, we are part of all this, of all this, entire world and we are just this little thing right <laughs> so i'm gonna maybe bring us almost to a close on um, patricia's statement